Woo, we're Ooh. here. We were just inside of that bedroom. <laughs> um, there's like two bedrooms here. And we were all um, just talking on and on about everything that we're about to talk about. So um, I wish you could have heard that as well. It was really, it was really smart. I don't know if we can turn that smart now. Back there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm going to be functioning as a kind of facilitator, um, and then we'll, I'm sure it'll go all over the place. Probably. Um, <laughs> I just want you to know you have your rosé over here. Oh, thank you. Yeah. We actually, we were like, we need rosé in order for it to be truly queer. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> And then, it's not a Provincetown gay history yeah, discussion exactly. without, rose, without rose in a barn. And we have to say like something really salty and then take a long sip. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I lamely have my questions on my phone, which is why I'm going to look at it occasionally. I tried to print it off and I couldn't. I'm sorry. I always find it like really annoying and stupid looking, but I'm about to be annoying and stupid looking. No judge. So my first question is um, for both of you. What's a rarely told LGBTQ story that's in your book that you want other people to know about? Um, something that has been overlooked? Oh, um, where to begin? Uh, I guess when we were back there, we should have gone over the questions. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would have been smart. It also would have been like uh, nice for me to have sent them to you. But oh, that's OK. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, I really don't know where to begin. I, I think that there are, it, there are two different, well, there's tons of answers, but two broad ways to answer that. One, um, there are a number of stories and, and details that we could point out. But then there's also just a lot of the, you know, dominant popular stories that we know, uh, we don't really know. Um, and, and so uh, what, I mean, if to go with the theme, Stonewall, uh, I, I feel like everybody knows but nobody really knows any anything about um, the the story of I mean, it, based on our research, Stonewall the bar did not sell shots, so this notion of someone throwing a shot glass uh, would seem would seem would seem off. Um, based on everything we know, Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, neither of them had gotten down there when the actual riots started, so the notion of it either of them starting it. Um, so there's details in the popular stories. I, I think uh, that one kind of striking uh, story is, is that you know, in, the 19, in 1973 when, when the activists had fought to have homosexuality removed from the DSM, uh, removed as a, a pathology, um, it didn't actually get entirely removed. If, if someone wanted to change if somebody you know wanted to seek uh, to 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 be cured, they still could, and that's where and they would be licensed professionals still that could yeah, yes. offer that yeah, and that's where conversion therapy mm -hmm. really it, out of what it, it is based, and and because we are so focused on our triumphs and our heroic tales, which of course are important, we often lose. Um, where our blind spots, and then they come roaring back when they've had horrible uh, uh, impacts. So, well, I, and I think along those lines is almost for a lot of people, at least everything pre Stonewall is a blind spot because we weren't having as sort of large public victories, and so there's an assumption that everybody lived lonely, unhappy lives, mm -hmm. um, and and we spent. A decent portion of the book is pre-Stonewall, and, and it is stories more than anything else, really, of individuals and, and the lives that they led, happy lives with, yeah. with their, their communities. And yeah, yeah, and no, I think that that's a better answer. Nice one. Um, <laughs> well, we, were, we, were, <laughs> we were talking about the, the like, noble suffering that we see represented in media often, yeah. right? Like it, 
queer lives are often presented as like we're suffering, but we're noble about it, and something, you know, <laughs> it, you know, it's there's something beautiful and tragic that that really sells, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, and I think I mean that's right. That that we in in order to kind of prop, and we do this. I feel like every generation, in in order to prop up how far we've come, we talk, we kind of denigrate, you know, the how sad it was to live back then and it, the way that history is presented, it, we don't dive in to how incredible it was and how joyous it was and the community that was built um, and, and, and what a you know, brave and profound act of resistance it was, uh, not just in the 50s, not just in the 40s, but, but going back, and, and while it's not the activism that we've come to define as marching in the street, but merely existing as a visible queer person, a profound act of resistance that needs to be celebrated where too often it is like, oh God, that must have been so hard. Well, screw you. You don't, I mean, yeah. like it might also might've been a great fun. They were having tons of fun. Like, well, we were just talking about like Molly houses. Do y'all know about Molly houses? <laughs> in, in England in the 18th century, and I, I think it was mostly the 18th century, um, there were these houses uh, that were usually underground, um, you know, you had to sort of know people to go to them. And they were basically a, a proto drag club um, with all sorts of orgies and um, they, would, they would perform like these fake marriage ceremonies. I mean, I think some of them were actually, they were taken as real marriage ceremonies, but sometimes they were mocking marriage and they would pour like pig's blood on each other. I mean, crazy stuff yeah. like that. Doesn't that sound fun? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's actually what we're doing later tonight. So. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And now, and now, you know. And At the A house. But I mean, we, we were talking earlier about, um, and I mean, this is going to press some buttons, but why not? You know, about Pete Buttigieg's statement about marriage, right? Um, by the, by where it was one vote. By the, the grace of, by the one, grace vote of one vote on the Supreme Court. Right. And, um, and you know, the, the idea that marriage is only tied to a piece of paper and the other marriages that people had or the, the ceremonies that people did in the Molly House were somehow not valid, um, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, and that is a constant theme in I mean, the way that underrepresented history is told, in particular the way queer history is told and what we try to uh, confront and I, think, I hope deconstruct is that that um, reliance and faith in our oppressor, I mean, the system, is, is really uh, harmful that, that, you know, his marriage exists, marriages exist because, A, you love somebody and you make a commitment to that person, whatever that commitment looks like, and B, from there, because of the work of queer activists and their attorneys fighting against a system that made no place for them. And eventually, after you know, however long, centuries, uh, enough work was done for a temporary, and we should all be aware that it is, very, <laughs> it is exceedingly temporary, uh, that, that we, we have this uh, you know, benefit. And, and it's not something that was given to us, it's something that we earned, um, and too often, the history is told as if we have, uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, hi. Um, uh, that we've, you know, that these rights are, are given um, by the benevolent majority as opposed to something that we have fought and died for. Um, and, and um, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, well, think, I mean, Mayor Pete's narrative, the often repeated narrative, I mean, it writes out both the private marriages that have gone on, and there's even photographic proof of going back many <coughs> decades, um, it writes them out of our history uh, because the state didn't recognize those marriages, but they meant the same thing to those people. Um, and then it also, yeah, it writes out all the activists and activist lawyers and everybody else who had worked for, for decades. I mean, we're, you can go back to an, an issue of one from the 50s that talks about marriage. Um, yeah. it, it wasn't a new idea. And, yeah. and Kennedy alone did not hand us this right. But, and, but and it's important to point out, as as you did earlier, that he, I mean, Mayor Pete, in and of itself, of, in and of himself, is queer history, and and th this speaks to a larger issue about kind of the detriment of not having a robust 
uh, access to and connection to our history is that that you know it, it, we, we need those who are creating new space and creating new history to speak the language of our history so that they don't, you know, it's the yeah. oldest cliche there is. I mean, not, not knowing your history, you'll, you'll repeat the mistake. And, and um, it is an incredible thing, no one is discounting that, to see yeah, a, a awesome. viable presidential candidate kissing his husband. Yeah. Uh, we wish that he, had the, he would use the platform to, to, I mean, when he speaks of why his marriage exists, um, to talk, you know, more about actually why it exists, which is... Well, it's a great cultural moment to bring up all this stuff, you know, like, that's how we get to have this debate in many ways, um, you know, because it's becoming a pop culture moment. Um, so, good for him. And he's, he's evolving, you know. Right. Um, I mean, one of the things that I found so fascinating about this book is, and as opposed to just looking at your Instagram, which is wonderful, but seeing everything, um, it's not necessarily linear, but everything put together in one book, you see a story of, in many ways, this um, debate that has been going on in queer circles forever, which is like, do we assimilate fully and accept the terms that the overculture has for us? Or do we resist? Do we riot? Do we, you know, just, get our claws out. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I, I think, I, I, I might say it a little <laughs> different. I just, do we accept the fact that our existence is a riot? Uh, and and that, that just walking around, by our, by our nature, there is nothing that we can do to actually accept the terms that they're trying to set. It is an impossible, uh, goal and and but we but there there is a significant chunk of of certainly within kind of the the establishment um, that that constantly tries to make it seem like the goal is this to be like them to be like everybody else to to integrate and that has been from the beginning of of you know at least queer uh, political organizing um, and from a personal experience, that's the way history is, is taught, that, that, that that's how it's always been, that the goal has always been this notion of, of rights, um, of, of, of integrating into the system. The, the story of the fact that there always have been militants loudly shouting, you know, maybe we just, maybe we should make them more like us, uh, really isn't told. And, and even those that do get told after they're gone, their story gets kind of dulled down and shaped into however we want to use it now. Well, can you tell the audience what you responded to Glad with? Right, so <laughs> Glad <laughs> recently tweeted out something about how incredible, so Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, the trans women of, of color, uh, started Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries. Um, they tweeted out something about the, the incredible peaceful protests of, of Sylvia and, and Marcia, <laughs> to, 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 which I, to which we responded a, a, a quote from Marcia saying that Star, Star, which is Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, believes in picking up the gun and killing the next cop. Uh, uh, they, 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 peaceful. <laughs> they just like responded to that tweet. <laughs> we don't have, we don't have to, we can, we can still make a point about these people without just shaping them to fit our narrative and it really is damaging to do that and uh, you know i believed that my history as a pe our, our history as a people basically started in 1969 and we continue to to perpetuate that that narrative yeah and i, I mean a real issue with it is if you're looking at our history from sort of the, the broader societal American history perspective and, and it's being whitewashed, I mean, you are leaving people out and, and victories are being celebrated when it's not a victory for the entire community. It is a, a victory for a portion of the community that looks more like the three of us sitting on the stage. And, and it, 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 I guess it was amazing. We didn't, I don't know if we expected to, to learn this when we started that, I mean, this, this fight between 
the sort of the radicals and the assimilationists has, has gone back, it's, as Matthew noted, from the start of sort of um, you know the true maybe queer liberation yeah. activist uh, history, uh, which was pretty stonewall. Right. Which was pretty stonewall. <laughs> well, so. I, I've been very fascinated with just in particular, you know, the Mattachine Society because. Um, I mean, it's morphed into so many different forms right. <laughs> throughout the years, right? Yeah, yeah, and a, a, a pet peeve of math is, yes, the, the, the foundation versus the society. Right, um, yeah. well, no, it, because it's a pet, well, yeah, it's a pet peeve of mine, damn it. <laughs> that, 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 Rightfully so. Uh, because it's, you'll constantly hear the Mattachine Society talked about as this monolith. Um, and in particular, again, it fits this narrative of this, the conservative Mattachine Society. People like Dick Leitch, who passed last year, you know, he was the conservative one pre-Stonewall. So Mattachine broke up, was in, was in three, at least three different eras. There was Mattachine Foundation, which was Harry Hay and the founders. They were communists. Um, they, they, were, they were radicals. They, they believed in creating our own culture, our own separatist space. Uh, they, got, they created this thing that got somewhat popular. Once it got popular, around, uh, about 52 or 53, this big wave of conservatives came in, and they started to preach that we just want to integrate, we just want, uh, you know, gay rights, and forced out the founders. That's when the Mattachine Society is born. There is a ton of internecine battles. Th that national organization breaks up, and then the Mattachine chapters, Mattachine mm -hmm. cha Society chapters, are are formed, uh, and they all have different personalities, and you know. This is why, and we say this all the time, Leighton and I are not popular at cocktail parties because somebody, <laughs> because somebody will start talking about the Madison Society and I'll be like, well, actually. it's actually the foundation was it. And they're like, you know, we're just trying to It's talk. really fun uh, to read though. <laughs> but it, but it's, also, it's also really important because like, these, these details matter because yeah. it wasn't just one big, the, you can't just talk about the Mattachine Society. These had, there were different personalities. There were tons of different people, and, and events happened that, that shaped the course of, uh, of our history. And, and, and really, the, the battle between the Foundation and the Society uh, in 53, there is a one-pager that was passed out at the Constitutional Convention where that came to a head that you really can't, I mean, it's like reading a mailer from the human rights campaign, I mean, it really is, like, and, and it won. I mean, it, 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 it took the day, and, and uh, there has been that kind of split a ever since. Um, and and uh, it's not, it's, again, it's just not as simple as saying what came before was conservative, now we're yeah. more woke, and whoever's <laughs> gonna come next is gonna be, it is. It, woker. It, right, woker. Um, <laughs> I, I want to talk a little bit about the, the challenges in creating a kind of narrative in your history book. Um, because, you know, you, you're obviously having to string together quite a few different ideas. Did you, you know, as you just said, it's incredibly complicated in many ways. Like each chapter was different. Um, how did you write about all that stuff and maintain a narrative? and also not erase parts of history? That's uh, a big question. Don't know that we did. <laughs> I mean, I, I, yeah, well, and, and the first draft was about double that, <laughs> that length. So um, I guess, and I mean, you're, you have a probably fuller answer on this, but it, it's amazing. And, and I think especially because it was a, early on, it was a rather small number of people who were, who were active in queer liberation. I mean, the the connections, um, people at the, showing up at the same event or one person weaving through different cities and events, it, it's amazing how, as you dig deeper and deeper, you, you see these connections. And, and so the, the narrative the starts to world. form itself <laughs> yeah. in a way. Um, yeah, I think, so you know, we started on, with, with the Instagram and w when we started the Instagram account, we had no idea what we were doing, um, and you just uh, suddenly got a hundred thousand followers. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, it took uh, a while. <laughs> didn't know what they were doing. Yeah. Uh, we, I mean, we, yeah, we, when we struck a nerve, because I, I, I mean, I think it, so. We're both attorneys by training. We're, uh, we're particular. Uh, we 
we research and write these long passages, whereas you know it's not just like hashtag love is love. It's it's, it's a little <laughs> more uh, detailed and and um, the you know the, one of the benefits of of the account is is that well one we don't it's, there isn't really a narrative right so these discrete posts we get to just do everything uh, as opposed to the book where we did it's it was much more difficult because right then all of a sudden we became editors and, and more curators because we had to decide the stories um, and I mean to Layton's point it became it became about finding the connections because the thing that had increasingly just shocked us uh, about about our history again I, I had learned it the kind of the popular history is, is this series of discrete savior, savior moments and heroes and sheroes that pop up and do these great things that take us ahead and then you know we have to wait another five ten years until somebody else you know Harvey Milk creates gay people running for <laughs> for office Edie Windsor creates gay marriage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and not to diminish the importance of those individuals, but of course there's a ton of work that's going on in the interim. It's like Rosa Parks, you know. Like, right. It's yeah, just, you like, find, it's just yeah. Rosa Parks suddenly right. did like, that. Just out of the blue. Um, it all started on yeah. that day. Right. And, and uh, so just trying to make the, the connections. Um, and yeah, I mean, like Leighton said, it, one, of the, one of the best examples which is just still kind of mind blowing. So I mean, you, the, what's considered the first homophile gay rights group in, in the U.S., the uh, Society for Human Rights in uh, Chicago, the Henry, Henry Gerber's in 1924, um, which you know very quickly got exposed and they all got arrested. And um, so five years later, Harry Hay in 1929 is cruising in, in uh, L.A. He meets his first lover, Champ Simmons. Um, Champ Simmons tells him, Harry Hay, of, of this, this mythical organization that he'd heard of in Chicago that had gotten broken up, and that sticks with Harry Hay for decades, this idea of organizing homosexuals. And it, you know, it, was, it was Henry Gerber's, and I mean, that, that thing, I mean, just mm -hmm. the, the grapevine that kind of weaved through, and Henry Gerber is also always told as this person who showed up in 1924, got ruined, and disappeared. He's a, he lived for 50 more years, and he writes some of the most radical letters to every every group, and he just gets angrier and angrier and angrier. It's awesome. Um, and he shows he's up at Madison. He's a troll. Yeah, he was a troll. He, he, was, a, he was a troll. Um, and it can be used for good. You know? yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was right. Yeah. Um, and so I mean, it, was, it, was, it was basically finding and following the threads um, in order to tell. Well, that, that strikes me as very beautiful. Because, Thank you. <laughs> because I, I mean, it, we often feel alone when we're doing something, um, and I mean, I know I experienced that with Boy Erased because early on, like my book wasn't selling much at all. It was not contrary to how it sounds immediately a New York Times bestseller, <laughs> yeah. um, but it, you know, it was it was not selling. But I was getting these emails from people who were saying. You know, I found this book, and it's like, help me. And then now there are all these activists doing so much work. It's not because of me. It's because I heard somebody else talk about their experience of conversion therapy. And it's just beautiful to see that traced out in our history as well. Um, it confirms that, really. And we need that confirmation. I mean, so much in this book, um, you know, a lot of you already know a lot of this, this history. But what it does is it compiles all of it in one place and lets us see the strands working together, which um, strangely, I don't think had been done or I hadn't read it in that way. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we certainly ha hadn't read it or, or, or and, and certainly and also with the, the combination of the, the imagery, I mean, part, part of our experience was has been so much about the photography, um, and and there's something so powerful about uh, you know this confirmation of queer life in the past. Uh, but it's so easy to see you know some delightful queen from 1972 Pride Parade, and even that just just the picture of a delightful queen is is enough. It makes you feel more complete. But if you actually 
learn the story, especially you know up until I don't know, 95 or so, most of the people that you're going to see in these bride parades were also there 364 days a year in the community center doing all kinds of other work. They have names, they have stories, and, and well, I mean, everybody, obviously, but, but, <laughs> but in particular, were part of the community and, and were activists the rest of the time. And as we started, it, it, is, it is, I can't like describe, thinking about when we first started the Instagram account, seeing these pictures and not knowing who they were and now going through and seeing these pictures and being like, oh, that's such and such and that's such and knowing what the signs mean. Like they used to just be funny signs and now they actually have deep meaning. And, yeah, and it can it, take on a whole different meaning than right, we are, a little bit more complex we are, than love is love. And com yeah. Right, a little bit more complex than love is love. <laughs> we are complete people with a history, with a story. Um, yeah, and, and I, I think, at least for me, I think I'm speaking for both of us, that the, I found that the photos really caught me, um, I think because it is such a, an unknown history that it almost, it, when you hear, you know, just bits and pieces here, here and there, it, it doesn't seem real somehow. I mean, you, you grow up mm -hmm. seeing George Washington on your dollar bill and, and you know, Lincoln on your penny. And, yeah. and so, I mean, there's a, a way to sort of visualize and, and it, it's just, that is American history. Um, when you don't, have the visuals connecting you to that history, at least for me, I, I felt disconnected from it. I, I, didn't, I didn't feel a part of the community that was creating that history. And, and with the photos, I think it really helped me with that. Yeah, and, and to add that, you know, that there's also a, a, a very serious generational disconnect because for so, you know, I'd say, any LGBTQ plus person over the age of 45 or 50 lived a very different life than at least a significant population of, of uh, people younger than that. And who, you know, much of the struggle that, that we're trying to impart in the history was a lived experience for a yeah. large population of, of, of our people. Whereas the space that was created by those who, who lived that life, um, we don't live in, that. the younger people don't yeah. have that. And all we want to hear and all we have heard about is how great things are and it gets better and love is love. And, and, and it, it's, it's more uncomfortable to read the history about that it was, it was really difficult and it was not all fun and it wasn't all triumph. And, and you know what, we need to be conscious of it because it's not, over and it, it continues to this day and when it, you, you need to be very aware of when gay queer organizations are telling you victory because we've heard that before uh, a number of times and while we deserve to be proud of the accomplishments that, that we have earned and that we have made um, we do not deserve to take breaks uh, yeah. for any significant amount of time yeah um, I was just thinking when you were talking about sort of this texture of history, um, because I'm writing fiction and my fiction is set in the 18th century about queer people before there was a word for it. Um, like it seems to me that part of your project in combining the written history and these images in such a way is to create that <coughs> texture for people to enter into the same way that literature does. Um, you know, there are many great novels about the AIDS crisis, for example, um, and that I think that's the best way, in many ways, for someone like me to enter into that. I mean, I, I grew up at the tail end of that, and and sort of the specter of, well, if you're gay, then you're going to have AIDS immediately and die. You know, that was like what was told to me, um, but I didn't live through the crisis itself. I only suffered the consequences of stereotyp you know, stereotypical ideas. Um, but like reading, I feel like reading or looking at a photo does something very different. It humanizes the experience. Yeah, no, I mean that, that uh, yes, I agree. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, it was more of like a comment. No, 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 yeah. I mean, it, 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 we have the same, we were, we, were, we were raised in the kind of shadow 
uh, of of the crisis, uh, which you know, I mean, the crisis is not over, but yeah. but the peak uh, era uh, of of the crisis, and and it certainly has um, informed. And we talked about this earlier that that it wasn't until doing the research for the book and really um, diving into the you know kind of the radicals of of the even the early 80s which is too often overlooked as pretty act up and they weren't doing anything um, it, it took diving into that history before I as an individual understood that AIDS wasn't our fault um, you know I've heard that tagline before but it took connecting with history to really come to understand what that meant and and to really internalize that and the, the, the impact that 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 has had on on my life to understand that no they like the, the Tylenol scare cyanide scare whatever else was going on Legionnaires disease if it had been anything else they would have saved us like that they let us die should we have been you know somewhat more responsible yes just like if if, if they're not taking you know disease food off the off the market because yeah so we have to somewhat like change our behavior a little bit, but that's not our fault. And I, you know, I really didn't know that. E even though they say that, I really didn't understand. And not only that, but we revolutionized medicine. We revolutionized sex um, in order to do what the establishment and, and the government wouldn't do. Uh, and so, and then the fact, like P Peter, a friend of ours, uh, I guess 70 or so, you know, he, he took, I mean, hearing, there's a picture of him in, in the book. We have, uh, he, he stopped counting funerals at 100, uh, and, and um, that type of detail, it's not something, it's not fathomable mm -hmm. to, 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 to me. But, um, it, but it brings you closer to yeah. beginning to understand. And beginning to understand that our responsibility is to listen and to mm -hmm. understand that when you are engaging with someone who was alive and, and is alive that you are dealing with someone who a has ptsd and rightly so and b has stories that you need to yeah. hear and and that we've used often a a tagline like you know, it killed an entire generation it didn't kill an entire generation it killed way too many people it murdered way too many people but there but that that line at least in my experience excused me from doing the hard work of connecting with the many survivors of, and it's not just gay men, it's not just bisexual men, it's all queer people, it's anyone who, who was uh, affected, of course, you know, also IV uh, drug users, Haitians, whoever, I mean, um, and, and we need to do the work of, of collecting our stories. And uh, ageism, again, plays a horrible role in this but talking to uh, folks who are survivors um, is, has been an incredible part of this project. Uh, the no, I mean, I don't, I, don't know how, I don't know how we did it, uh, but we did it because we had to, and that, we should all take great pride in that. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, in doing all this research for your book, did you, I mean, I guess my first question is, what were the sources that you really gravitated towards? Um, and then a spinoff of that question is like, did you find anything that upended your own biases? You know, because you write in your intro about not knowing much about queer history in 2015, yeah? And now here you are, right? Um, and I saw y'all speak earlier in P-Town like with such authority about these different moments in history. We weren't, <laughs> Very, pop, we weren't popular at that Oh, I liked it. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was kind of irreverent, but it was fun. Um, and, and I think, uh, I just want to know more about that process. Well, I, I think one of the benefits of, of starting with the Instagram and not really starting out with any expectations, so I, I think we were willing to sort of take our time um, I mean, we really just started independently uh, researching after after we <laughs> realized sort of collectively that we knew nothing. Um, we sort of dove into our 
separate corners and, and I'm more visual, so I was sort of doing a lot of photos and, and, and Matthew was doing more reading and research and, and we, yeah, we, I guess it, it gave us time to learn and, and as the account, you know, to our amazement, kept growing, it also was giving us more, that started giving us contacts and, and resources that, that we could turn to and, and continue to learn from and, and so um, we'd been spending a lot of time before we ever considered a book as a, a real possibility. Uh, I mean, we had sort of devoted our lives already, even though we were you know, secretly still doing law. Um, Are y'all still <laughs> secretly doing law? He's still, he's still secretly an attorney. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, yeah, and, and so I, I think that did, that gave us um, sort of a, a buffer to, to start to learn enough to know, start to really learn what we didn't know and, and to sort of know where to begin to turn to, right. to find some of that. Yeah, I mean, it, it was, it's a profound thing to you put up a picture and, and, and more and more it started to happen that we'd get either you know, comments or emails or whatever that that's me. Someone saying like, that's, that's, that's me or yeah. that's my lover or that's, I was, I was there that, and, and the, the, there were, history <clears throat> is, feels dead, right? I mean, it, no matter what history you're talking about. And, and all of a sudden, it, not only are, 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 they, are so, much, so much of our history alive, they're on Instagram. Uh, and, 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 uh, and just like all social media users, they, they're not afraid to tell you when you're wrong. Um, yeah. and, and, I was gonna ask about that too. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, uh, you know, yeah. It's, it's not always easy to call out what's of good conscience. I mean, there's also just a lot of performative anger and, and um, that is but, the internet <laughs> right uh, but then when it came time to, to do the research for the book um, so w when we started I thought it was going to be using a lot of secondary sources yeah I'm just gonna read I'm just gonna read the books um, so I, this is where kind of our lawyer kind of OCD stuff so I started to check in notes and check citations and you'll find very quickly that secondary sources are citing Secondary yeah. sources, uh, and then I, so it's like a there's a Marx it's Brothers, an echo chamber, yeah, there's right? a Marx Brothers skit yeah. where you have to keep buying the book in order to figure out which horse to bet on, and and he ends up with just a ton of books, and by the end of it, the race has already started. Um, <laughs> sorry, we need uh, to like have a screen. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, <laughs> trust Topical, me, it's yeah. hilarious. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Marx Brothers never get old, um, but that that. Uh, and when you finally get, you finally find the one secondary source that has an, you know, a, a primary source, it would be some oral history, some interview that was done 20 years after yeah, the fact. You just which, have to trust right, it. Right, which you yeah. don't, we don't discount entirely, but it is certainly not a primary source. And, and this separates us from historians up until just a few years ago, uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of documents have been digitized and put on through the Library of Congress and through NYPL and your public library, where you know I could sit at my desk and it's like the Google of queer history, looking at meeting minutes from the Daughters of Belitis mm -hmm. in 1950, you know, four or 1955, um, and, and and so all of our we 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 don't I I don't think I mean we tried not to say a sentence or write a sentence without primary sources. Um, That's great. And, and, and multiple, because, and even then, we use a lot of adverbs, um, because we got tired of reading these definitive histories, because when is history ever really definitive? Um, yeah, and the, I mean, the online digitization, and, and I mean, so it's something we, we are in awe of the archives, and, and we just try to encourage, yeah. um, going back a ways for, for people to, I mean, if they're, not sort of assisting in some other way. I mean, if you can, give some money to these archives yeah, because it's, right, yeah. yeah. Um, or your stuff. But, or right. your stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's a whole different time. Yeah. But the, I mean, because we couldn't have done what we did, certainly in that yeah. amount of time, just a few years ago, really. I mean, that it would be, I mean, having to physically go to archives yeah. and, and, and painstakingly go through all this. I mean, that's, that's a lifetime of work almost. Uh, right, because you'd but, have to know what you were looking for. Like our benefit was that I could just type in one yeah, search term and it, it. And, it, and it 
comes up with everything. Um, so I had like a really profound moment where I was I was looking at issues of vice versa. Lisa Ben, who's an anagram for lesbian, it's really fun. Um, uh, she wrote this like sort of what's considered to be one of the first zines for lesbians and. Um, in the first issue I think that I read, she describes this world in which there's like this perfect utopia of queer people and they don't care about straight people. And I was like, this is so much more woke than like yeah. how we were 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I felt like um, history came alive to me because I understood that these discussions have been and taking place on. forever, but you would think they just started last year, right? right? You would think with the way that things are framed online and the way that things are reported out, right, that these ideas are suddenly in the mix. You know, it's like the Me Too movement. Like, yeah. everyone just thinks it suddenly happened. And, and well, that's such a, a sad part of our history not being taught in schools and everywhere else is that it's so much more difficult to build upon what people have already done, what mm -hmm. the thoughts they've already had. Um, because you are sort of not quite starting from scratch, but I mean, a lot of people are, I mean, yeah, having to create a foundation that really is already there, they just don't know it. Yeah. Um, and there's that quote uh, in the intro from an Audre Lorde quote that we have a historical amnesia that uh, keeps us having to reinvent the wheel every time we have to go to the store for bread. Uh, yeah. that, that, and, and, you know, I mean, it is true of, of, yes, it's that, of course, we need. A more robust every, every underrepresented history taught in school. We need greater access to queer history. But it's also what we've realized in this is that it is we are past the time where uh, those of us who exist in the space created by uh, you know those whose stories we're amplifying um, use our privilege to tell the history. So I, I, I at my law firm when I was still at a law firm, I was I very it was great to be gay. Right, I was one of the gay attorneys. They would trot, trot it out. And be like, hey, he's one of our one of our gay attorneys. Oh, I, I was Look, on. I was we're a, diverse. I, yeah, yeah look, we're diverse. Yeah, he's white, but he's gay. Um, and, and but bringing all of the 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 what I've learned, I learned as an attorney, you know, about research and writing to focus all of that. And I work I work harder as a queer historian than I ever did as an attorney. Um, and and uh, that. It's time that, that those with the privilege that we have by those who came, or created by those who came before, start to use it uh, for you know, those who will come after us. And, and it's, yeah. it, it, we also believed that it's impossible to access the history, that there isn't, there's only a finite world of it. It's absolutely incorrect. These archives are endless. Yeah. And, and we need, you know, used to be out of the bars and into the streets, out of the streets and into the archives. So we, need, we need people to, to get in there and start Archive telling. Archive activism. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, I, I, I really was so shocked just looking at those archives. Um, do yourself a favor and do that. Maybe not today because it's so beautiful, but yeah. Um, yeah, I, what was I going to go with? I had a really good question. That I don't doubt really that profound, for a second. And now it's like gone away. Well, I could just keep talking. Y'all could, yeah. The archives are me. Ask me a question. <laughs> um, wait, it was right. I had too much rosé already. No. <laughs> Not enough food. Um, <laughs> I told you it's that. Killing me. Yeah, I was supposed to fill your blank space, but really, I'll just stare at you. Yeah, you can ask me a question. Oh, wait, nah. <laughs> well, can we talk about the uh, the reformer or the the tyrant turned reformer? Yeah. Let's talk so, about I mean, so, the, like I said, in, in Boy Erased, um, and part, so part of the work that we that we do and what we've tried to <clears throat> counteract is is that so often underrepresented history, particularly queer history, is is told from a, a perspective of our oppressor coming to realize we're not that bad, and and it's the story of people coming to terms with us um, yeah. and and um, like to make it concrete you know John Smith who ran Love in Action where I was sent to conversion therapy he he um, you know he left Love in Action and now he's married and living with his husband in Paris Texas 
And, um, you know, in the media, this is what drove me insane for so many years. I felt so alone. Um, this American Life ran, like, a whole story about how John Smith had changed his mind. He got the most media coverage. Even after Boy Race became a movie, everything, he still, I think, had more media coverage than I ever had um, because his story was sexy to people. It was sexy because here's this demon turned angel, right? That's my other take on the <laughs> tyrant story. Um, and and it's, that's an American myth that has been perpetuated, you know, forever, um, which is that, and, and ironically, it's the change that like was sort of being touted by somebody like John Smith saying, you can change anything about yourself. It's the American dream, right? Like you can do anything, you can become anyone, you can become Gatsby, whatever. Um, and, and so Smith's story plays into that. Right? Here was this horrible monster who was very successful at torturing children and having them commit suicide, who has now become like a perfect you know, gay man. Um, and, and it's frustrating. Well, it's, yeah, and I mean, it robs, I, I mean, I don't want to speak, I can't speak for it, but I, I would think it would rob you of uh, anger that, that it's impossible to come out and really, I mean, call him what he is, in some ways, a, at least indirect murderer, because, yeah. hey, he apologized. He, he yeah. you know, it, it, it dulls that. And, and over and over again in our history, we have that. And, and it's, uh, it's on the oppressed to get over it because, hey, they've apologized. They, they're, they've yeah. let, they're letting us get married. They're letting us in the military. They're letting us do, you know, we'll get there eventually. Uh, and, and, and so we don't have an outlet for our community's reasonable and deep and lasting anger. Yeah. And, 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 and it gets turned inward, of course. And of course, for so long, you try, you try to be this version of yourself where you can forgive someone mm -hmm. like that. And in many ways, I have, because I've talked to him enough to where I, I'm just like, oh, it's just John. He's crazy. Um, but like, he's not going to hurt anyone now, I don't think. Um, but you know, there's this role you have to perform when you've gone through something very publicly. Um, and you know, this man is like reaching out and posting stuff on Facebook and tagging you and all this stuff. And you have to, like, you look like a jerk if you're like, I don't want to deal with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and, and that's why I think yeah. so often yeah, society and they want you to thank they them for the trickling story. some rights or here. Yeah. I mean, after all the awful he did, he's yeah. now speaking well, yeah. out against that awful. And it's and like I went through ten years of like being trapped in a labyrinth in my mind right. and losing. I, I feel like I would have written five books by now. Right. Yeah, I and I, I guess I look at it as a difference between, you know sort of maybe forgiving even, um, you know, allowing them to show up to the party, but, yeah. but to celebrate is, yeah. is to me a whole well, different story was, and, and it just ignores I those almost, who like really I, fought. I feel like I almost turned down the whole movie thing whenever they bought his life rights, um, and which he managed to, I mean, I was fine with the life rights because I understood how that works, but he managed to work into that contract um, like his book rights, which his book is bullshit. It's crazy. Um, and it like makes it look soft and like, oh, well, I was really helping a lot of people even though it was bad. Um, and I was like, you, like, we're really going to buy his book rights. I, it was like $5,000 or whatever, but is the principle. Right, absolutely. I was like, are we really, and I ended up saying yes, because at some point, you make that mental calculation where you're like, I could save lives, and this is bullshit, but I guess I've got to go along with it. Yep. Um, and, it and the producers, I love them. They were fantastic people. The whole team was wonderful. But they could not understand why I was ready to walk away. Right. They couldn't understand it at all. And, it's and I was like, you just put my book on the same level as his. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's not a book. It's a piece of trash. Uh, like, uh, uh, yeah. And, yeah. And I think so. I mean, I think that that what we what, what we didn't even realize was a thing, and what we have since tried to do is that our book and our work is 
queer history. It is a history of what we have done, what queer, how queer people have organized, how we have interacted with each other and organized. And, and that often is, there's a lot of internal uh, fights and, and that's not always pretty, but the, the, the dominant culture uh, is tangential. It, it, how, how they were thinking, what they were doing, isn't the focus. This is a, our history. Yeah. Like, whether or not they were digging it wasn't, I mean, that was a question that was being debated within our community, um, but it, it really sets kind of the, the oppressor, the, the tyrant, whether or not they reformed, off to the side yeah. and, and focuses on how we uh, were, were, were doing. Well, I'm reminded a little bit of, yeah, I'm reminded a little bit of Toni Morrison, how she always talked about, you know, when she wrote The Bluest Eye and all of her great books, she was not writing to a white audience. She didn't even think about them. She was like, I'm going to tell the truths in my community and I'm going to tell it the way it looks. I'm not even going to think about how this could be used for stereotypes, et cetera. I'm going to write it the way I want to. And then she was celebrated, right? You, you don't ever know when the jackpot is going to happen, like when you might become marketable or whatever, your story becomes something cool to the dominant culture. But like she did it on her own terms, which makes it beautiful to me. You know, she's actually reforming the way people think because she never compromised. Um, and that's incredibly hard. I mean, if we're going to be real here, like, I probably compromised, like, several times when my story was becoming bigger. I, you know, you're, you're making these negotiations and thinking, well, I'm getting these emails from people, and imagine the emails that I'll get whenever this movie comes out and save people's lives, and right. et cetera. And so you're, like, making all these little adjustments. And it, I think the reason it continues to be a debate about assimilation in our, in our culture, right, is, is that it is a debate. You know, I mean, I think we, we all <laughs> heavily lean toward one side, right? But, but it's something that I think is not going to go away because as long as we're seen, you talk a lot about being seen in this book, right? Um, as long as we are being seen, we're being seen by a lot of people. And there's no way to get around that. We're not just being seen by ourselves, which is so wonderful and important. But, you know, books like this, which become more mainstream, um, they're seen by the dominant culture, and then you have to start making decisions about what you do with that. Right. View. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it's human nature. I think we'll always be a minority. Um, so I think there will always be a tendency to want to sort of assimilate, fit This in. isn't part I mean, of the gay agenda, to turn everyone Yeah. <laughs> I mean, OK, not, yeah, I misspoke. <laughs> we won't always be. <laughs> that, that's you know, 5% more after this okay. book. Um, <laughs> But it, so I, I mean, especially young, you're, you're going to want to fit in and, um, well, and and well, it's not just fit in. I mean, we talk and we again, we talked about this. Right? Like, okay, we're being we got to do okay, questions. No, but the, 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 <laughs> it, what, whatever you need to do to survive, whatever you need to do to be in like with your family and your friends, that's fine. I mean, we're not asking people to be just radical in your face. Fuck you to everyone around you. Like that's not a, that's not a livable. It's, it's not a, a scenario you can, but that's also, you don't have to bring your love is love, I have, you know, I'm building bridges to those that hate us. That's not also not a political approach for liberation. And th there does need to be a separation that once you come into a queer space when we're talking about how we're going to build a path forward uh, for us, we don't absolutely have to be talking about, well, what are they going to let us do? Because they're never going to let you do it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Not until you demand it. Exactly.